You guys are sounding awesome out there. You're sounding like men and women who dream. I'm, uh, I'm still buzzing from the European Missions Conference right there, zeal for your father's house. And uh, I know dreams come true because uh, I see the smile on Victor Como's face right there. And I see that smile's equally as big on Krista O'Ching's face right there, or Krista Como, because of course they got married right there. And uh, Victor let me know already, the honeymoon is not over. <laughs> they are still fired up in the Lord. Be turning over to Psalms chapter 126. I bring you greetings from Madrid, Spain. And uh, como estas? Yo soy Miguelito. I was trying to hablo de Espanol while I was up there. And thank God they have a lot of grace on me. Much forgiveness is in that small remnant group there. But uh, we had an incredible time. They now call me Tapas Michael. And uh, because in Spain, you have the little small dishes right there called tapas. And I, I just began to be addicted to tapas or tapas. And uh, so they just nicknamed me Tapas Michael. And uh, it just was an incredible time there just getting with the, the, the group there, uh, Francisco and Albi, uh, who are now, dare we say, the leaders of that group. Uh, but they, uh, they renewed their vows, and I did their wedding. And uh, it was an incredible wedding. Uh, of course, Satan had his little mitts in there trying to make it uh, a discouraging time uh, because the wedding wound up starting a little bit late. So it was a little uncomfortable when I had about 50 uh, Spanish speakers looking at me, and all I could say was, como estas? <laughs> but nonetheless, we, we pulled off the, the, the wedding. They renewed their vows. And what was so special is as they're renewing their vows, and, and I say, Francisco, Tell, tell your wife how much you love her. And, and I'll be tell your wife how much. They, they just spend two seconds on themselves, and then they turn to their family. And they just start telling them about the dream of Jesus. <laughs> they start telling them about what, and I started getting uncomfortable. I mean, Francisco went for probably about 20 minutes. <laughs> and, and she went equally as long. And they're just talking about God, talking. And I'm just <laughs> sitting there, como estas? <laughs> you know, that's all I can say as the preacher. Uh, I had a translator there. and uh, But even with that, I didn't have much to say. And, and, and yet... It was just awesome because at the end of their vows, they, they said, we are moving to London, England, to be with the church, to embrace the dream of Jesus Christ. It was very encouraging. Many of the individuals who did not have faith in God, many of the individuals who had come out for the first time, and yet there was only literally about four or five from the remnant, including myself, uh, and there were about 70 people at the wedding, and yet there were several that came up to me and said, when you start a church here, we will join. When God sends a church here, this is the kind of thing. I, I've never seen this in all of Madrid. It, it was shocking. It, was, it built my faith because there's only a few of us, and yet I see that the dream of Jesus wants to be accomplished, having disciples in every single nation in this generation. Yeah. Title of the lesson is the dream. Amen. Psalms chapter 126. Psalms chapter 126. It says in verse 1, when the Lord brought back the captives, to Zion. We were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter. Our songs, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. And the church said, Amen. this is such an encouraging scripture about how God continues to use his people. What happened here? This is the third generation after the promised land had been conquered. Of course, we know about Exodus and how they came through the, the, the desert right there. God parted the, the waters, and, and there we say God saved them. The Old Testament is the physical foreshadowing of all the New Testament spiritual realities. So in other words, things that happen in a physical sense in the Old Testament happen in a spiritual sense in the New Testament. And so that first group that came out of Egypt, they did. They, they, they conquered the promised land. The second group, they conquered the promised land. But the third group right there, those are the, that, that's the group that was unfaithful. And that was the third generation. Uh, th th that, that's the group that got cast back into exile in Babylon. Dare we say Egypt all over again, just a little different. Uh, and when they got cast back into Babylon, th this was not a good thing for them. This was not an encouraging thing. Th this was from the discipline of God. 
And so when, when you don't really want to embrace the dream of, of God, then there comes a discipline, and that happened to God's people. And they were put into Babylon. Say, so what happened after that? Well, when you're in Babylon, that, that's equivalent to, to not necessarily being close to God. Prayerfully, we're not in Babylon this morning. And yet, Isaiah the prophet, Jeremiah the prophet came to God's people and said, for 70 years, you're going to be in Babylon. You're going to be disciplined by God. And so, of course, in that Babylonian captivity, dare we say there were no dreams. Or if you were in captivity, it was more probably like a nightmare that you were not with God's people. You were not in Jerusalem. You were not in Zion. You were in the wrong place. And when, as a Christian, you're in the wrong place, it, it just doesn't feel so good in your spirit. Are you with me right there? And yet, even in the midst of that, there, there was still a remnant of disciples that, that were dreaming to go back to Zion, to Jerusalem, to build God's temple. And what's powerful about this scripture is it says when God called them to go back to embracing his dream of conquering the promised land, it says our mouths were filled with laughter, so they were happy, our tongues with songs of joy. I mean, the songs weren't just like, okay, we're just going to sing it just to... No, they, they were fire, kind of like what we were doing this morning. Amen. Men who dream, women who dream. And then it, what's interesting, it says, then it was said among the nations. Well, who were the nations? Well, the nations were the enemies. The nations were the, those who hated the Israelites, those who did not like the Christians. And what's said right here says, then it was said among the nations. Even those who didn't like the Christians saw that God had did good things for them. Even those that didn't like Israel or didn't, dare we say, want to become Christians, they go, well, you know, hey, the Lord has done great things for you guys. <laughs> the Lord has blessed you. The Lord has moved powerfully. And yet it's so inspirational when people that are not even disciples see Christians and they see good things happening amongst those who call themselves the people of God. We had dinner last night with Simon and Rebecca. Oh, yeah. And talk about dream come true. Uh, let me tell you something. Uh, Simon uh, organized this incredible uh, date right there, and, and, and Rebecca came out. You know, Rebecca's kind of like the Holy Spirit. She's just kind of quiet but super <laughs> convicting. She just kind of comes on in right there. She's a little dashing. Looks like she's 29 years old right there. Uh, and she just comes on in, and she's with my wife, and, and we're, we're having a great, great, great dinner right there. And, and, and then Simon says, can I sing a song? And you know Simon's that incredible voice right there. Breaks out the guitar. Uh, the, the waiter just... He just goes away, and there's just this perfect little space for us. It's just almost like a dream right there. And I'm sitting there, what am I doing in this thing here? And, and then Simon just starts singing, you know, with that soft voice. And Rebecca, you're such a woman of God. The Lord has brought us together. I don't remember the words, but it was awesome. <laughs> and he's just going to town right there, and he was confident, and he's looking at her, and Rebecca's just sitting there. She's, she's, she's kind of getting a little nervous right there. And, it, and he says all these inspirational, just dreamlike words at the end of it, and he goes, and I just want to ask you, will you be my girlfriend? <laughs> and, of course, she said yes. <laughs> Rebecca and Simon are now dating right there in the kingdom of God. And, you know, what's so awesome about that is, you know how we are nowadays. We get Facebook out of Facebook right there. Of course, my wife, she beat me to the punch right there. I was trying to do it, but she, she just like, phew, she, it's already online right there. Thanks, sweetheart. You know, I kind of wanted to share that good news. But so she puts it online, and all of a sudden, and then what was inspirational wasn't necessarily all the disciples that were encouraging, but it was individuals that were not Christians. And it was an individual who grabbed the clip of Simon singing and just posted it on their Facebook. Like, wow, God is doing great things in that church. Amen. And they posted it on their, their status like that. And I said, well, that, that's a testimony that even when the world is, is watching us and going, wow, God's doing great things amongst you, that, that, that is special right there. Yeah. And yet the dream of Jesus is really to put that dream in everybody. That, that's what we are. We, we are dreamers. That, that, I, I'm dreaming for a church of 10,000 here in London. Amen. I, I'm dreaming for a day when we have incredible, incredible worship services we hear that, that, that you got the concert you got movies you got you got all these incredible things going on that draw people to us and he's like god has done great things among them right there are you dreaming turn to haggai chapter one are you dreaming the scariest thing as a disciple isn't dreaming god-sized dreams the scariest thing as a disciple is not having a dream 
in Haggai chapter 1. We turn over there. Because sadly, amongst God's people, yes, there were those who were dreaming to go back to Zion, go back to building the temple, but there was a small remnant that said, you know what? Not time. It's not time to be dreaming for the Lord. It's not time. And of course, you know, when, when, when you try, you know, God is kind of like, I always explain, following God is like riding in a convertible. You know, you're riding in that convertible, and when you get to that stoplight, you're kind of like, okay, God, can you, can you move on can you, can you, like this? And, and God's like, just calm down. I got this. But then when God starts going down the hill, and he wants you to throw your hands in the air, you're like, slow down, Lord. And yet we just got to sit in the ride right there and, and let God take us where he wants to take us. Yet there were remnant disciples right here that, that did not want to go back. And we know that because 18 years into them going back to Zion, th there were some that tried to block and did not want to build God's temple. And God sends them a, 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 a kind of a festive prophet, a guy who's kind of full of energy. His name was Haggai. That's what festive means, Haggai. So if you're in Haggai chapter 1, he sends them Haggai to try to, dare we say, encourage them. Haggai says this, verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. That was disciples who said that. That was disciples that it was not time to build the house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Agai. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now, paneled houses were for kings. If you study out uh, the Bible and you study out kings, you'll see that all the paneled houses weren't just the houses of the regular individuals. It was for kings. So these individual disciples really had spent quite a bit of money building up their own lives. And yes, there's the literal houses, but, but I'm talking about just focusing on a, a, a dream that isn't a God dream, a dream that isn't a God-willed dream, and paneling it up using all your resources to build a dream that will not accomplish great destiny for many people. And yet it says here, it says it's time for you to be living in your panel houses while this house remains a ruin. Verse 5, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. Put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it, the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down the timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. He says, when, when you build the house of God, God is honored. And we know the word ecclesia means church. It means the people. The house of God is the people. The house of God is the church. And, and God wants all shapes, all sizes, all colors. God, God, want, you know, I was encouraged today. I got a chance to meet a Brazilian in the fellowship. <laughs> and, and, you know, he's got that, you know, kind of the handsome features right there. And, and he's sitting in the front row right here. Uh, and, and, and then I just started looking at all the different color shades. And I go, wow, this is, this is what it's about. it's about. It's about the Nigerians. It's about the Ghanaians. It's about the English. It's about even the Americans in the house of God right there. It's about the Polish right there. It, it's about the Portuguese. I remember our brother being baptized right there at the European Missions Conference right there. Really on the back. But, but, but it's about building the house of God where all people are in it. And, and he says, when you do that, God is honored. Of course, when you don't, God is dishonored. He says, you expected much, but see, I turned it to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because, I, because my house, which remains in ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their due and the earth its crops. He says, when you are more focused on building your house, God will make you unfruitful. He says, when you're more focused on building your house and not his house, God will make you unfruitful. Dare we say, it, God will block some of your own personal dreams because your dream isn't to embrace the dream of Jesus. And, you know, I, I, I tell you, I, I've seen it where, where, where in my life I really wanted my dream before I want God's dream. I really wanted my will before I wanted God's will. And the only way you'll get your will is if you do God's will. 
In fact, you got to do God's will in order to get your will. Are you with me right here? God isn't the only one who has a dream for you. Satan does as well. Satan's dream is for you not to love God's dream. And yet here he says, I've withheld the heavens, withheld their due on the earth and its crops. You've been unfruitful because you've not embraced my dream. He says, I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains on the grain, the new wine, the oil, whatever the ground produces on men and cattle and on labor of your hands. We, we've got to build the house of God. Amen. The time is right now. Yeah. Are you guys with me here? Yeah. It is the time. The time is right now. You know, I think about individuals that have changed the world. They've changed the world because they had a dream. Yeah. They had a dream. Oftentimes, a literal dream that was turned into deeds that were blessed because it was something that could change the world. I think about being an American myself. Well, African-American right there. Amen. Uh, I'm in Africa. Okay. Uh, I, I think about Thomas Jefferson. Uh, of course, he uh, attributed his philosophy uh, contained in the Declaration of Independence. He attributed that to a dream that he had. He said he had a dream, and then he, he did it. Uh, I think about Albert Einstein. Uh, his theory of relativity actually came to him in a dream as a young boy. I think about some of the other individuals that have changed the world. Dr. Frederick Banting, who discovered insulin. He discovered insulin in a dream. He thought about it in a dream, and it led him to a great pursuit. And of course, he won a Nobel Peace Prize right there. Uh, I think of even Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. That was inspired by, by a dream, more like a nightmare to me. Uh, I think about Bob Dylan for those musicians, those AMS out there. Uh, Bob Dylan, most of his music was composed because he had a dream about the song first. Even Paul McCartney praised his song yesterday to a dream he had that he put into practice by writing those lyrics. The movie Avatar. This was a dream by James Cameron before it became a reality and a TV show. Even the series Twilight started as a dream, <laughs> which we know is more like a nightmare. What kind of dreams do you have? Are you a dreamer? What is your dream? Is it a God-focused dream or a man-focused dream? Is it a God-willed dream or a man-willed dream? It was said like this by one individual. A man without vision is a man without a future. A man without a future will always return to his past. Another individual said, a knife cuts because it has narrow focus. A knife cuts because it has narrow focus. A coward dies a thousand deaths, but a brave man dies only once. Another individual said this. When God predetermined our destiny, he factored in our stupidity. <laughs> Therefore, there's always enough time to finish your dreams. Yeah, that one gave me great encouragement right there. The level of sacrifice that an environment requires will determine the size of the people that will follow. I'll say it better for our understanding. The level of sacrifice that a dream requires will determine the size of the people that will follow. How big are we here in London? How big are we? You know, I, I love the theater. If you haven't, couldn't tell by my animated emotions here that are exposed in my young daughter, Mia Grace, right there. She's just full of energy right there. I don't know where she gets it from. Yeah. Uh, but one of my favorite musicals is, uh, you know, the, the musical Les Miserables. And just, just an incredible, incredible, incredible just, it's about dreams. And, and, and uh, Fantine, one of the, one of the characters, uh, sings, dare we say, kind of a hauntingly uh, scary song. Uh, and, and, and the words were, I dreamed a dream in the days gone by. And, and, and it's about this dream that was dreamed, but, but then the challenges in life made it a nightmare. The challenges made it a nightmare. And there was unhappiness. And in one of the last lines is, uh, this is the hell that I'm living in because I have not accomplished my dream. Very scary. Uh, when I look through the Bible, there are many that had incredible dreams. I look at Joseph and his incredible dream. Yet there were his brothers that opposed that dream because they thought he was arrogant. And he probably was a little bit. And then I look at, I, I even look at Abraham. And that 
God gave him the dream to go to another nation. To go to, to pack up and leave and go to another nation. Now, when you study out Abraham, there's something that's very important for every dreamer that's here. Number one, he had a God-focused dream, but when he, he, he started to live out that dream, there came tests. And not only one test, two tests, but the test began to be progressive. I put before you that God allows progressive testing to come on you when you embrace his dream. You say, what's progressive testing? Well, each test leads to the next test. And each test gets greater until God has all of your heart. And yet we understand that Abraham was tested to go to another country. Abraham was tested with his own wife that he said, oh, that's my sister. And he got afraid, and, and he literally prostituted his sister. He got a fr his wife, rather. He prostituted her and said, this is my sister. And, and yet that was a test from God. And all of the tests led up to the ultimate, which was what I call the Isaac challenge, where God called him to sacrifice his own son, Isaac. Now, many people think Isaac was a little bitty baby, little Isaac didn't know nothing. But the Bible says that Isaac carried the wood for the sacrifice. And the Bible says that Isaac's wife was about 127 when she died, and she had him when she was about 90. Isaac was about 35 years old. 33. This wasn't a little baby little Isaac. Isaac was an adult. Isaac was about the same age of Jesus. Isaac could have totally overpowered his weaker Abraham, his weaker father, but he was submissive to the will of his father and allowed himself to be sacrificed right there, and yet he didn't get sacrificed. There was a lamb that came on in right there, amen? But each test by Abraham led to the ultimate, sacrificing that which was most important to him. Are you guys with me right here? And yet when you embrace the dream of God, oftentimes there is progressive testing to get you to a point where, where, where the greatest thing you have isn't what you have, but it's God. The most precious thing to you is God, his will, his commands, his dream. And yet it's only going to be those people that can really be the revolutionaries to accomplish the dream of Jesus. Point number one. Jesus was a revolutionary. Are you? Luke chapter 4. You guys still with me here? Yeah. You know, I'm so fired up about our dream here in London. Our dream is to embrace the dream of Jesus, which is to make disciples of every single nation in this generation. And, you know, I, I was encouraged about our uh, European Missions Conference. And, you know, it was very interesting being in Madrid because the individual that was translating for me I, I got about five minutes with him, and I was able to tell him a little bit about my life. And he asked me what I moved to London for, and I told him the dream of Jesus. He asked me how many kids I had, and I told him, you know, I have three children. I have Mia, I have Michael, I have Shreya. He asked me, what are you doing in London? I said, well, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a preacher there. He goes, well, you, you, I, I heard you came from a conference. What was that all about? And I told him about the Crown of Thorns project. And, and he said, anything else? And I told him a bunch of other little things, but the only things that he remembered were the Crown of Thorns project, the Crown of Thorns project, the Crown of Thorns project, and then my family. And so in Spanish, he was literally going, Crown of Thorns, London, England. Crown of Thorns, starting in London, England. And he's saying this, and, and, and I, I can hear the Crown of Thorns. I can understand that part. <laughs> but by the end of the, end of the wedding, everybody was coming up to me going, yeah, I, I want to tell me about this Crown of Thorns part. <laughs> it was so <laughs> convicting for me. And yet, I'm sure we know our crown of thorns here in London. Yeah. Let me remind you, in 2016, we're going to Stockholm. Yeah. In 2017, we're planting a church in Amsterdam. Yeah. In 2018, we're going to Madrid, Spain to plant a church there. Yeah. In 2019, we're going to Berlin, Germany right there. In 2020, we're going to Rome. 2021, we're going to Bucharest. 2022, Warsaw. 2023, or 2024, we're going to Athens. Now, we can change our crown of thorns. I see a few Irish looking at me out there. I see a few others looking at me out there. I see a few others. It's okay. It's okay. I like that look. That's a good look. That's the look of a dreamer. And yet, to accomplish the dream, we, we've got to really understand that it takes revolutionary change to change the scientific, worldly mind of Europe. 
And so if it takes revolutionary change, it takes revolutionaries. That's what revolution means. Revolution means in involving or causing complete and dramatic change. Revolutionary new drug. Yet Jesus caused dramatic change. He was a revolutionary. Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 16, or verse 18, rather. This is after the temptation of Jesus. He gets tempted by the devil. The devil flees, and it says in verse, six, or verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is on me. He says, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, to recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And the church said, Amen. I mean, wouldn't you be fired up if you literally saw a scripture fulfilled in your hearing? Well, I put before you, that is happening right now. Amen. We are evangelizing the nations in this generation. Amen. It is happening right today. This scripture is being fulfilled in your hearing. It is being fulfilled. I'm so fired up about uh, we're, we're going to Moscow, Russia. Oleg and Aliona, they're going to be planning a church next year in Moscow. And, and so we're going to get Moscow. You say, well, what happened the last time we went to Moscow? In the first year, we had 800 baptisms. See, a lot of the Russians were rushing into the kingdom of God right there. And I believe they'll rush right back on in again. Once we build it, they will come. And yet we see right here that this was revolutionary because this was Jesus not only calling Jews, but he was calling the Gentiles. He was coming to change everything. There were a lot of Jews that thought they were saved. And, and, and yet Jesus said, nah, I, I know you believe in a lot of teachings, but I want to teach you the true God is me. I am the prophet that you've heard about, that you've been preached, that, that all your prophets, because they believe in the prophets, all those prophets that talked about a guy that's coming, I am that guy. And so this was very moving. Jesus was a revolutionary. When I think about revolutionaries, I think about some of the individuals that have caused dramatic change just from a worldly standpoint. I think about Desmond Tutu and the South African uh, social rights, uh, as a South African social rights activist. Uh, I think about Fidel Castro. Not everybody likes him right there, amen. But uh, he started the Cuban uh, Revolution. Uh, I think about the first American president, George Washington. Uh, I think about Mandela. Uh, quite a long walk to freedom right there. 27 years. No discipling. Nobody to build him on up. Nobody to answer his Facebook or his text or his call or call back. You can destroy the dreamer, but a God-sized dream you cannot destroy. Because you can't destroy God. And he, he really believed, listen, I want to liberate my people. And he didn't let anything take him on out. I'm sure he had some dark days. But he held on to that long walk to freedom, and nothing stole his dream. Of course, we got Guy Fox who had a dream here, his gunpowder plot. Thank God it, he didn't see that one happen right there. Uh, I think about Harriet Tubman. Uh, I, I just think about some of the great dreamers. I think about uh, Ho, Chi, uh, Ho Chi Minh. He led the Vietnamese nationalist movement. He actually lived in London then moved to France, and he was a founding member of the, the French Communist uh, Party right there. Uh, and th th this is th these are just worldly dreams, but these were people that were revolutionaries, that wanted dramatic change. First of all, do, do you want dramatic change? Do you want to change Europe? Do, do you want to change the way, the thought process that's here? Do you want to change people from bumping in each other on the tube to loving each other when you get on the two. <laughs> do you want to do you want to change this? You know, you see people that everybody's thinking something, but they're doing this. I'm everybody's like freaked out. I'm so afraid. Just, you, know, you, you go to talk, say, hey, how are you? <laughs> you want to change that? It takes a revolution. It takes a people that are, are, are who care less what others think that want to change their environment and not let their environment change them. Jesus was a revolutionary. Let's look at how he started. Mark chapter 1. You guys still with me? Yeah. Verse 16. It says, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you apostles that will go all around the world. You just got to check to make sure you're reading the Bible there. It says, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. 
at once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their, their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Right here we see that Jesus' first calling was not to give out salvation, was not to make someone more religious, but was to pass on the dream. He says, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That was how Jesus began revolution, by giving individuals the dream. How many did he win? He won three right here. Those are the first ones that he won. He didn't win everybody. The Bible says Zebedee stayed in his boat. Not everybody wants the dream of Jesus. Jesus doesn't get discouraged by that. He doesn't stop dreaming. He continues to preach the dream in chapter 3. In verse 13. He's got three dreamers. Now let's see how many he gets. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to them those that he wanted. And they came to him. He appointed 12, designating them apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and have authority to drive out demons. And the church said, Amen. okay, so he goes from getting three to now he gets 12. What happens with this 12? Turn to John chapter 4. This is about six to nine months after Jesus had walked with them. Six to nine months after he's put the dream in the 12, we find out what happens. John chapter 4, verse 1. It says, the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but who? His disciples. See, you know when you have the dream of Jesus because you're baptizing. You're baptizing. And right here, th th this is, historians believe, it's almost about a year. It, this isn't five years into Jesus being with them, six years. This is just nine months. And they had the dream because they were baptizing individuals. What happens after that? Luke chapter 10. Let's see if the dream keeps spreading. Luke chapter 10. In verse 1. We are a Bible church, so we get a few scriptures this morning. Amen. That way you know it's not me. You know it's the word of God. So if anything I say is not in the word of God, blow it away like shaft. Don't, don't even listen. But if it's the word of God, it's not me speaking to you. It literally is God speaking to you. Amen. It says in verse 1, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And, of course, he sends them out two by two because two represents strength. I mean, when you go out by yourself, sometimes you can be a little chicken right there to share your faith. But when you got another brother right there or a sister right there that you sometimes may want to impress or you want to show your witty little skills or what you studied out in your quiet time or your cool new way of inspiring somebody, you go, bro, yeah, let's, come on, bro, let's go do this. Or, come on, sis, let's go. Let's, you know, you go out two by two, it makes you stronger. Yeah. It helps you when you go out two by two. And yet Jesus gets 72 that have the dream right there. 72 that have the dream. And then in chapter 10, in verse 17, let's see how they feel about the dream. It says the 72 return with discouragement, <laughs> sadness, and insecurity. Mm. Mad at Jesus. Yeah. No. It says the 72 returned with joy. They returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. See, demons submit in the name of Jesus. They won't submit in your name. But when you call people to do something because this is what Jesus does, there can be a submission right there to that which stops them. And Jesus says, hey, he says, here, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the powers of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, don't rejoice the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And the church said, Amen. I mean, this, this is kind of awesome because they, they have the dream so much, they love the dream more than they love God. <laughs> and yet, yet, we can't love the dream more than we love God. But this is an awesome thing in a sense that 72 had the dream. You know, it's kind of cool when you have people that are really wanting the dream, and you got to calm them down. That, that, that's okay. It, it's not so cool when you, you got to ramp people up, persuade people to embrace the dream of Jesus. 
And right here we see the 72 had the dream. Do you have the dream? Are you a dream giver? When you study the Bible, are you studying the Bible with people? Or are you passing on the dream? Are you passing on the dream of Jesus Christ? Turn to Acts chapter 1. You know, I'm so encouraged about all the incredible miracles that are happening in the kingdom of God. I'm so encouraged. Uh, one of the things that super encouraged me uh, was seeing how God's level of commitment can call anybody to be a true disciple. Sorry about that, guys. If you read the Good News email, there was an individual by the name of Jano. And J Jano was an atheist. J Jano studied the Bible. And the disciples tried to give him the dream of Jesus. And he says, you know, I don't believe in a God. And he was very, very hard. And, and he says, I don't want nothing to do with you guys. You're weird. You're a cult. Leave me alone. I don't know if you've ever had any of that happen to you before. Well, seven years into his rebellion against God, a few things happen in his life. Number one, he loses his relationship. Number two, he loses his home. Number three, he loses all of the incredible, encouraging things that were going on in his music career. And he found himself at 33 years old struggling. Then he had a heart attack. That's a nightmare. And yet, somehow he gets a hold of the remnant group in Stockholm. He says, when you guys studied the Bible with me, I, I was in rebellion to the dream. But tell, tell me, does God still have plans for my life? The brothers go, yes, but we're, 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 we're here in Stockholm, and you know the only way you're really going to get the help you need is to, to move to, to Los Angeles, California. I know you're Estonian, but you need to move to Sweden, and then you need to move to L.A. to study the Bible. So he moved to Sweden. Then after he moved to Sweden, he moved all the way to Los Angeles, California. Amen. He studied the Bible and got baptized. Amen. What's your excuse? See, if you don't call people to total commitment to the dream, if you don't call them to total, if you don't preach with deep conviction, people don't receive it with deep conviction. And yet that, 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 that miracle is for all of us in Europe to know that you can call somebody to go from East Ham to be here at church at 10 o'clock in the morning. It's not radical to get on the tube and, oh, and, and make it out to church in central London. That's not radical. We've got to be dream dreamers that fulfill the dream. Let's look at the dream team right here. Acts chapter 1. Let's see if the dream team fulfilled Jesus' dream. Acts chapter 1. In verse 15. It says, in those days, Peter stood up amongst the believers, a group numbering about 120. Now you got 120 dreamers. You got 120. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Verse 40. It says, with many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message, those who accepted the dream, were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now, how many have the dream? 3,120. Not 3,000, because you got the 120 right there, right? See, you'd be discouraged if people left you out of that 120 right there. So you got 3,120 that have the dream. Acts chapter 4. Verse 4. It says, but many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to be to about 5,000. I love our men's night out. It, it is crazy. We, we are a radical, crazy group of men. I feel like God has given me the perfect guys to take Europe. I feel like I'm with the perfect guys to take Europe. How do I know we're crazy? How do I know we're radical? I, I, you know, the, the, the Wednesday night before I got a chance to go to Madrid, we, we had a sharing time about the European Missions Conference. And you had all the brothers sharing their dreams and this, that, and the other. And, and I'll never forget, of course, Tim Kernan preached a sermon about tearing your robe. <laughs> Just having a broken heart towards what we need to do. 
and turn your robe. And then James Morgan stands up. And James Morgan just uh, tears his robe, tears his whole shirt off. He's standing there with no shirt. It's men's night out, amen. So, bro, you may want to put a shirt on right there. But, but, and then he tells him, be quiet. I got the dream. I want to go to Ireland. I want to go to Ireland. I want to plant a church in Ireland. And the question I have is, did you laugh or do you have that same zeal? Did you, did you, did you criticize in your heart because you're a cooler? You're a little bit more posh. Let me tell you something. To be a real dreamer to change the world, you can care less what people think about you. You've got to be someone who's willing to stand firm and hold on to the teachings of what the scriptures teach. And it takes revolutionaries to bring revolutionary change. To bring revolutionary change. Acts chapter 6. They're fulfilling the dream, guys. We see it in the Bible. It says in verse 1, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing. That's how it was in those days. That's how it needs to be in these days. It says the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Oh, my goodness. There were some bad attitudes in the first century church. They were complaining. I know we're, none of us have ever complained before. Surely not us. Surely not. None of us sisters have said, a little gossip going on right there. And none of us brothers have gotten a bad attitude. Right here, we have bad attitudes in the church. Of course, the leaders get in there and sort it on out. And the Bible just simply says, after they sort it out, the word of the Lord continued to spread. There was an increase in those who embraced the dream. There was not the love of problems. In Acts chapter 11, it simply says in verse 21, the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turn to the Lord. In Acts chapter 14, verse 1, it says, At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively, a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. The Holy Spirit adds the word effective. Are you guys with me here? Effective preaching is when you call someone to total commitment from the beginning. You know, in the Bible, in Luke chapter 14, it says, if you don't give up everything, you cannot be a Christian. You cannot be a, a disciple. Not literal, but sometimes it's literal. But this is a heart change, that you've got to be willing to give up everything to be a disciple. Now, everything isn't 10%. 10% is 10%. So effective preaching is not only calling someone to fall in love with God, but helping them to understand that you've got to sacrifice to build the house of God. That means calling people to, to, to give contribution, to give a tithe. Ten percent is a tithe. That's what they gave in the Old Testament. And being a Bible church, we believe in, we believe in giving a tithe. Well, okay, just had a check right there. Now, ten percent is ten percent of your gross income. And you're not giving to the church, you're giving to God. And I say gross income because you give to the king before you give to the queen. Right? We love the king, Jesus, more than we love the, we love the queen. She's awesome. Right, the queen celebration, but we got to have the Jesus celebration. And yet the question has got to be asked, are you tithing? Are you giving 10% of your gross income? Are you truly giving this small, I mean, you got 10 origins and, 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 and you're holding them and God just wants one of them. <laughs> and you go, no, I need to keep that one. I'll make my little orange juice over here. <laughs> I'm scared. You do that, you'll be under a curse. He'll take all 10 away from you. And yet that has scared me a lot. And yet th this cannot be our heart. And when we preach, we've got to help under individuals understand there is there is a financial sacrifice that you've got. You've got to be tithing. Yeah. Effective preaching doesn't wait until right before someone wants to become a disciple. Say, oh, yeah. Hey. Uh, hey. Did, uh, we're going to get baptized in a few minutes here. Uh, do you want to give anything to the building of the temple of the Lord right here? <laughs> Money is attached to the heart. You don't believe me? I, I challenge you right now to give everything you have to the church. See? See that quietness right there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right there. There's a, so 
as disciples, we've got to be effective in helping individuals know we can't wait to the last minute to tell them the commands and the challenges that are found in Scripture. We've got to do that from the beginning. There was an effectiveness here to their speaking. They didn't wait till late in the game to tell people the cost of being a disciple. You guys still with me there? Yeah. Bring it home. Acts chapter 16, verse 5. In Acts 16, verse 5, the Bible says, So the churches were strengthened in faith and grew daily in numbers. This teaches that they had daily additions. Daily additions. Not only did Jerusalem have daily additions. You know what this means? All the churches had daily additions. That means there are seven days in a week, right? Campus? Amen? That means there were seven additions a week. Now, the only way we're going to get to seven editions a week is when we have regions with region leaders who can lead Bible, groups of Bible talks where each Bible talk is fruitful and you have three or four editions in the east, three or four editions in the north, three or four editions in the, in, in the west, three or four editions in the south region that we get started here. And so you get all these editions. Before you know it, every region has got an edition, and you got eight, you got nine, you got more than daily editions. Jesus said we can do more. We can do greater things than him. This is happening in Los Angeles, California. This is happening. You know how many additions they've had thus far this year? 456 additions. Amen. That is God. Acts chapter 17, verse 5. It says, but the Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They crushed. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brothers before the city officials shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. Isn't that an encouraging statement? Don't you want to be known as a troublemaker? Don't, don't you want to be known in your workplace as causing trouble? with your religious teaching about Jesus Christ? <laughs> Causing trouble on the campus with trying to teach people they need to love Jesus? Causing trouble on the internet instead of getting into trouble on the internet? <laughs> I mean, that, that, that can be a challenge. I mean, I, I had to confess this week. I, I, I just, I got myself into trouble. I, I saw a few images and I went, click. And I just felt the dream just get weird in my heart. It wasn't good. I had to be open about my sin. So it didn't steal my faith and steal the dream. Are you guys with me here? And yet we see here, they cause trouble all over the world. The dream of Jesus makes you a troublemaker. But when we want their praise, the praise of men, we, we don't want that trouble sometimes. And the cool thing about the London and Ashton Christian Church, I know that's not us. We got troublemakers here. And we want to cause trouble all over the world right here. We, we got young troublemakers, old troublemakers. Female troublemakers, kid troublemakers. We got troublemakers because we want to embrace the dream of Jesus. What is the price of the dream in closing? Turn back to Psalms chapter 126. Psalms 126. You know, before we hit the price, I want to challenge you not to be a dream killer. Not to be a dream killer. Say, so what's a dream killer? Well, dream killers are when you become the disciple known as too discouraged to encourage. You're too discouraged to encourage. You, you know, the Friday night, we, we had a campus devotional. It was the most incredible devotional we've had all year, in my opinion. We just got together and encouraged one another. Now, the word encouragement means to give the strength of God. So it was cool. All the sisters made cookies and cakes and, 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 and made homemade cards. And the brothers made uh, novels of just, just long cards, handmade, and they gave them to the sisters. Now, sadly, some of the sisters said, this is the first time I've ever made cakes or cookies for an individual. Oh. <laughs> and sadly, some of the brothers said, this is the first time I've given someone a card. Oh. Sadly. But encouragingly, there was just a spirit of building one another up. 
And I can, I'll never forget our brother Hepworth. Yeah. Hepworth, he had to encourage Tuli. Now, you know Tuli. Tuli is, Tuli is, she's, she's like Rebecca, the Holy Spirit, quiet but super effective. And, and she's just sitting there, and then, and then Hepworth. He <laughs> Hepworth gets down. Tuli. On his knee, you are a sister that is special. God is good. You are quiet, but you are powerful. And he's and Tuli is just sitting there just going, oh my goodness, what is going on here? Nothing. He's encouraging you. And it was, it was just so awesome. Everybody encouraged one another. And there was just a spirit of joy. Because the Bible says, Encourage one another daily so you're not hardened by sin's deceitfulness, Hebrews chapter 3. It doesn't say discourage one another daily. It says encourage one another daily. And yet I really believe if you're too discouraged to encourage, you're a dream killer. Nothing should steal your joy. When you're too depressed to give your best, you can be a dream killer. When you're full of despair and you just don't care, you can be a dream killer. And the one that really kills dreams the most is the criticizer, the fault finder, Mr. or Mrs. Glass Halfway Empty. Now, we won't go through numbers. We'll look at that at our leaders' meeting. But complaining caused individuals salvation. Because when you complain against leadership, you're not complaining against leadership. You're complaining against God. But because we know it's wrong to complain against God, the leader is a better, a better target because he's probably imperfect. So complaining against the leader is easier because we know we can't. All of us, you don't even have to be a Christian to know it's wrong to complain against God. But when we complain against a leader and who's infallible and probably has some things you can complain about, I know I got a ton, th that makes us feel better about our complaining. But you kill dreams. You kill dreams in your own heart. And you can kill dreams of others by picking each other apart and not encouraging one another. The price of the dream simply stated in closing is tears. Psalms chapter 126 and verse 4 as I bring it in for a close. Simply says here, going back to that original scripture we read, restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Now, I know we understand what was going on right here. Of course, when you would be someone who, w w the farmers, when they would go out and sow, they, they would have a bag of seed. And they would go out and they would sow the seed. And then, of course, the seed gets watered and then there was a crop. But what was going on right here is the Israelites, the Christians, oftentimes, well, they, they were very poor. And you, you were challenged. You had your one bag of seed that could feed your family for four, five, maybe six months. And the call of God was to take that one bag you had that was supposed to be allocated for your family and to take that bag and to trust that sacrificing that one bag would not only produce joy, but you'd get the blessing of those seeds turning into fruit. So you had to take that one bag out, look at your kids, know you were taking food out of their mouths, and you had to sow. And so literally the farmer was just sowing in tears. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Looking at his kids, looking at his family, thinking about his own life. I'm literally giving up what I have to live on, trusting that God is going to bless them. And so they literally would sow with tears, knowing they would reap songs of joy. He says, he who goes out weeping, carrying seed, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Basically saying, God will bless it. And God did bless it. The price of the dream is tears. It's tears. Los Angeles, California had a six times Thanksgiving Day missions contribution. And in their six times, they, they, they were looking to raise funds to continue building the church, to continue seeing Jesus' dream accomplished. We have two resources, money and people. 
We don't believe in buying a big old building and all that. We believe in using the funds to start churches all around the world. You want to know where the money goes? Starting churches. <laughs> Simple and plain. Doing everything we can to start churches. And yet sometimes when you've got to sacrifice that Isaac, sacrifice that which is close to you, there can be some tears right there. There can be some tears. Yet with their six times missions contribution, you know what they were able to raise? They were able to raise not six times their missions contribution, not seven times, not eight, not nine, not 10, not 11, not 12, not 13, not 14, not 15, not 16, not 17, not 18, not 19, not 20 times, not 21, not 22, not 23, not 24, not 25, not 26. They raised 27 times their weekly giving for their missions. 798,000 U.S. dollars. We got our five times in December. Five times. That's it. The Lord. Just five times, guys. For some of you, it may be tears. Awesome. Good. But we can not have a spirit where we want part of our church. And our church is the church worldwide. Where we allow part of our church to sacrifice with tears and the other part not to sacrifice with tears. Not to put in a tearful effort to raise the funds. Not to sacrifice things that may cause tears in our hearts. I, you, you guys know my story. I, I had a Mercedes Benz. That was my glory of my life. I want a Mercedes Benz. I bought a Mercedes had to sell it. And I used the money to come here. Awesome. I'll do it again. I don't have the idol of Mercedes in my heart anymore. It's gone. We got to blow out our five times missions contribution. We got to blow it out just like all of our brothers and sisters around the world are blowing out their contribution. We got to have tears for the lost. In Luke chapter 19, verse 41, the Bible just says Jesus wept for, for Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. And he wept for the city. I want to challenge you this morning to cry for London. I want to challenge you this morning to cry for the cities that need churches. I want to challenge you this morning to cry for those who have fallen away, to soften your heart, and allow every single Bible study that you have to come from the spirit of tears, of brokenheartedness towards where people are at in their sin. You know, God allows things to soften your heart. And there's nothing that softens your heart like a death. I never forget get being in Vancouver, Washington, and having the, 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 the great mission team that the Lord gave me to start a, 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 a group in Vancouver, Washington. You say, who did the Lord give you? Michelle. So me and Michelle moved to Vancouver, Washington to start the Vancouver region. <laughs> Nobody said, hey, Michael. Can you go? No, none of that. No hand holding. Go ahead. Oh, go do it. <laughs> like, oh, no. How do we do? Let's pray. So we prayed, and we got a few disciples. They said they'd come and join us. Then a few more, they'd come and join us. Then we started preaching the word. It was awesome. And we took that group from, from 2 to, to 44. It was great. Uh, we, we, we built a great base right there. And one of the individuals was, was a sister who, who struggled off and on with her commitment to, to the dream. And, of course, we moved to L.A., and then we moved here to London. And I got a Facebook from her about two weeks ago saying she, she was struggling with, with, with her faith and she, she, was, she didn't know where to go. I said, move to London. She goes, I know I can be used there. I go, you can. Move to London. Yeah, I don't know. I said, move to London. And we went back and forth and then I didn't hear anything. Of course, coming back from Madrid, it broke my heart to find out that she died. Now, I don't know if it was suicide. And there's an autopsy being done on her right now. But it just broke my heart. Because if she's not right with God, we are not out to have religious Bible studies with people where we make them disciples of us. We're calling people to fall in love with Jesus. 
so Satan doesn't steal the dream from their heart and time runs out. Let us build this church with fear. That is the cost to God be all the glory. Bless all stand, brothers and sisters. We're going to sing When the Morning Comes. Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God will lead us to that blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eye, and we'll follow till.